Hey there everyone, welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rogajan, aka The Seattle Data Guy. Today we're going to be talking about BigQuery, and the reason being, I have talked about Snowflake, I've talked about Databricks, in fact, I've talked about both of them multiple times, and I realized that really, I don't want to give free marketing to just them, there's plenty of other tools out there that you can pick, especially when you're trying to build your cloud data warehouse. BigQuery being one of the very popular ones. BigQuery is really the data warehouse option when it comes to working in GCP. Most of us don't tend to like, I think, Redshift, so AWS's version. GCP tends to be, I think, the one winner, at least the one winner with a cloud when it comes to data warehouses. I think BigQuery tends to be pretty popular. In many ways, BigQuery is the first iteration of a cloud native data warehouse. It kind of beat Snowflake to the punch, but it really didn't gain as much popularity, at least in marketing sense, and that could just be on Google for not marketing enough, but it also provides tons of papers that you can look into to learn more of how it kind of got built up over time and it has a lot of interesting architecture underneath that honestly you'll probably never actually interact with. But if you are planning to build on top of GCP, it probably makes sense to think about utilizing BigQuery. So let's dive into what BigQuery is and also we'll dive into the UI in the latter half of this video. So what is BigQuery? Again, it is a cloud data warehouse that has a serverless architecture that also, similar to Snowflake, separates storage and compute, meaning you can run essentially an infinite amount of compute or queries, right, is likely how you're going to run it, on whatever data you have. There are some limitations in terms of like how BigQuery in particular limits how many queries you're running. They call these things slots, and in general, they only give by default about 2,000 slots per BigQuery instance. We can talk about that more later. Now, if you are looking at BigQuery and you're wondering how are things running and how are things managed, there's a couple of big components that you'll often hear, although probably never have to interact with if you're just writing queries against it. That is Dremel, Jupyter, Colossus, and Borg. All these very fun words to mean some pretty straightforward things, right? Dremel uh, essentially turns those SQL queries into execution trees. That's where we get the term slots. Slots are actually referencing the leaves. So basically the different sections of compute that you're going to need to break down and run. So you're going to break down a query. It's going to break down to an execution tree. Each of those will kind of be broken down into single pieces of work. And then those eventually get re-aggregated together by what they call mixers, which are the branches. But again, you're kind of just breaking down the query and then re-aggregating it together. Like many data warehouses in general, BigQuery uses a columnar storage format as well as a compression algorithm. So this is something similar you'll see in Redshift where they both use a columnar storage format, also compress the data down, which makes it often faster to run aggregation queries as well as makes it more efficient to store. So again, if you haven't or if you need to know more about this, this is kind of that OLTP versus OLAP. Generally, a lot of OLAP, not always has a columnar storage underneath because generally speaking, when it comes to running analytical queries, having things in columnar formats, so data that is essentially connected or stored in columns versus in rows is more effective. But I will say that a data warehouse does not have to have a columnar storage underneath. It's just far more efficient. Jupyter is just the network that it basically BigQuery uses in between your storage and your compute to kind of pass data in efficiently. And then Borg essentially is the runner of all that. It is the thing that allocates hardware. It kind of manages all of the mixers and all of that together. The thing about BigQuery is I will say that you kind of don't need to know too much about this. There is some value because, you know, you can understand slots better, but overall, most people will probably not have to go into the nitty gritty of BigQuery. Some other key points to point out about BigQuery, at least some fun points. Sometimes you'll see something called legacy SQL versus either something like standard SQL or something of that nature. And basically BigQuery initially tried to develop its own version of SQL. I don't know why. You can't beat SQL. Eventually they had to go over and realize that everyone's just going to use anti-SQL and they should probably switch. So occasionally you might run into a one-off BigQuery project that's still using for some reason legacy SQL. That's all that's happening if you're running into it. Now we can talk about pricing and essentially there's two types of pricing. One is on-demand pricing, the other is capacity pricing. So on-demand pricing, you are essentially charged for how much data is processed, how many bytes is processed. They always say the first terabyte is free. On the other side, you have capacity pricing. For that side, you are charged uh, for compute capacity used to run queries measured in slots over time. So essentially for capacity pricing, you pay for a certain amount or certain quantity of slots. So a certain amount of compute, essentially, starting around... I think it's like 100 slots. That's about where it starts, I think, per month. And you essentially have this fixed number. So if you kind of have a better idea of how much you need uh, and you want more or less, it's generally where you'll go. But a lot of people just probably sit on the on-demand uh, side. In terms of actual costs on the on-demand side, you pay $6.25 for every terabyte, the first terabyte being free. So that one's free. And for pay-as-you-go, it's $0.04 cents per slot hour. 
there are some differences there. They've got some things where it's like if you commit certain ways, depending where you live, standard edition, enterprise edition, those, that's just kind of your standard pricing. I will say this pricing tends to be a little more frustrating to me than a Snowflake where I can very easily just say like, hey, if you turn it on, you're paying for it, you turn it off, you're not. One of the things that happens when you're running queries on BigQuery is you click go and it kind of figures out how much it's going to process, right? Like it kind of runs it and tells you later how much it actually took in terms of how much it processed. If you're doing on demand, you kind of figure out later. They do try to calculate it ahead of time, tell you it's about this much, right? It's going to process about 500 megabytes, but it just feels a little more of me throwing it into the ether and hoping it comes back. It isn't too expensive. Now, for this next half of this video, let's dive into BigQuery and actually look at it. So we'll set it up. I have an account that I haven't set up yet. So we'll actually start show the whole like enable your free credits and so on and so forth. So with that, guys, let's dive into actually digging into BigQuery. See you guys down there. All right, so we're going to set up BigQuery just to kind of give you a good understanding of it. You can use this 300 credits here if you'd like. You can just try and try things out for free. Most likely you won't run into things in terms of cost, especially if you're doing you know, smaller data, you've got a free terabyte. So if you agree and continue, you'll have to like eventually put down your credit card. And so if you don't want to do that, you can just go down, look at BigQuery. And I've already got it enabled. Done. Uh, so this is just set up to my first project. You can kind of set up a new project pretty simply by setting new project. If you have organizations, you can add them here. I will say, just as a funny thing, I swear every time when I'm looking for organizations, so if I go back and then I go to my projects, this will always put you on most recent. So I can't tell you the amount of times I've been like, I can't find, like someone will be like, hey, I just added you to this project. I'm like, I can't find it. I can't find it. Because you need to hit all. <laughs> like, it's like, I, it's uh, not the best in terms of UI. Because every time I'm on recent, I'm like, why can't I find these new projects that people are adding me to? Because it's on all and you have to figure out the organization first. So just a quick thing. If you are working in the real world, someone might add you to it and you might just not see it, especially if you're a consultant. So from there, what you'll see is you have a ton of functionality here, right? I've used data transfers, for example, a lot to create a transfer. If you want to create a transfer, so you can literally like pull data from a ton of different places. Oh, I've got to enable the API. You'll often have to do this. There's a bunch of APIs that take time. If this takes two or three minutes. I might do it. Okay, cool. Perfect. So you can see, you can get sources from Amazon S3, and this can literally just load data into your data warehouse. So Amazon S3, Azure Blob Storage, there's a few others as well. Like, so if you have like a Google Cloud Storage, you should have a file somewhere. And we'll do that in the next set of videos, like how to load different data sets here. Um, we'll do Google Cloud Storage, et cetera. There's a couple others. You can see they've got some little snarky migration from Redshift. You want to migrate from there? And a few other places. I could also pull things from my own YouTube channel. So they do have a few easy data transfers there. Uh, you can schedule queries. So if you have some queries, you want to build tables, you can do that here as well. Again, you can create schedules query and then a few other things as well. But probably what you care about is studio, right? You want to look at the actual data and the actual running of queries. So what is great? One, and they obviously give you some, some ways to keep track of this data. So you can actually track your queries. If you have any, if you share queries, it's just nifty in terms of if you are in a larger organization, that's all very helpful. You can also add data if you don't have any, because as you'll see, I don't have any data yet here. If you need to add data, I can actually add data, go to public data sets and find some here, go for free, of course. So if you have some queries you want to run and you're like, hey, I just want to practice analyzing data, you can look through here and find a few or data sets. I think they should have the CMS one. Yeah, I've got some stuff here. Stuff I got for standards, disease control, view data sets. Okay, cool. What you'll notice here is that I've got my BigQuery project here. There's no data here. But again, there's this public data set that they have. And this is where you can find all those, those data sets that I was talking about. So here it is. I don't know why I didn't look it up or find CMS when I was looking for it. If you want to see some CMS data sets or healthcare data sets, you can find it here. They've got a few data sets that you can just kind of keep digging into. So if you're like, I don't have any data to work on, um, try queries. That's not true. You have so many. You can query, it queries data if you just want to pull it out. And then from here, it's pretty straightforward, right? Select star just to show you what this has in it, just for the sake of it. We'll run it. It will return data down here. You can see you can do everything from save results, right? Like you normally might. You can go to Google Drive. You can download it. It's not too big. You can even open it in uh, Sheets or if you've got a studio somewhere, you can integrate it there. You can also see your job information. So again, remember, how much did it cost? Well, right now we've only written uh, or run about four megabytes of query. You can see slot seconds here. So they do try to give you that information. And so it's all here. And so that's it. So now you can run queries on this data. You know, when I first started all of this and I had to like dig into these data sets, I would have to download SQL Server or something or Postgres and then 
ingest data and make sure I ingested it correctly. Now you have really so many data sets here. You know, if you're trying to get used to BigQuery and just SQL in general that you can dig into. So tons of free data sets here that you can dig into. You don't even need to put in your credit card to do, you know, a decent amount of querying. So if you're complaining that you have no free methods, here's a bunch of, of free data sets you can look into. Don't have to do anything other than what you did. And then you can run some queries. So that is your BigQuery 101. The next video is going to be all about actually loading data into BigQuery. So again, we talked about some, which is via data transforms. I'll leave here. I think there is save. So I can create a transfer, do some of that. Uh, we'll do that from like local Google Cloud Storage in. We'll do like Google Sheet in. And then we'll look at other tools like Estuary, which is one of the, the tools that I've used a lot to load into um, things like Snowflake and Databricks and so on. And so we'll look at different ways as well as like custom coding and writing your own. So hopefully that's helpful for you to understand what BigQuery is, how you can use it, at least get intro to it. And in the next video, we'll get a little deeper. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you all next time. Thanks all. Goodbye.